Good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed your lunch as well as I did. And thank you, ladies. I assume ladies. We may have some chefs in the church. I'm not sure. But thank you, ladies, for putting forth the effort and making us a deluxe meal. It was much appreciated. And um, I think it's a good sign that if you are a cook or a chef or whatever, how you would qualify yourself, if you eat your own cooking, that's a good sign, right? So I was glad to see that. Our topic for this afternoon is going to be probably one that puts more fear in more people than anything else, and that's cancer. So you see we're, we're covering the, the biggies, so to speak. We've talked last night. I wanted to give you an overview of protein so that you would see the significance, and not only both in the area of treating disease, but also in the area of causing disease. And we learned from that that, in general, a plant-based protein, even if it's at a larger quantity than what we need, is a whole lot less of a problem than an animal-based protein. But all protein still comes from the same source, and that is vegetables. It's just that when a cow eats the vegetables, they store or produce certain amount of protein that they store in their muscle. When a human eats certain proteins, they do the same thing. That's why we don't eat humans, by the way. Um, so we stay with our broccoli, we stay with our cabbage, we stay with our foods so that we get our food firsthand. See, animal products are secondhand food. You're, you're passing your food through another source. We learned from the World War I and World War II studies that when we were having a famine in the land, that it was a much wiser move, and to keep my population alive, but also a lot more healthy, is we said, okay, let's not feed our food to the animals where we get maybe a 5 or a 10% reduction. In other words, to get one pound of beef, I have to feed 10 pounds of corn or 15 pounds of corn. So if I got a shortage, it doesn't make sense for the animal to have my food. Give it directly to you. The other principle that we didn't talk about is you always will do better eating lower on the food chain. Now, the food chain is the little fish that eats the plantain that's eaten by the bigger fish on up. So what I'm trying to encourage you is to be like the smallest fish that eats the vegetables that's getting eaten by the bigger fish. And you know where the human is, right, on this food chain line? Uh, we're the big we're the, we're the shark or whatever. We're, we're, we're the top of the line, so to speak. So I want to encourage you to eat as low as you can on the food chain, which means you go to your own garden and you pick your own produce or you do whatever and please enjoy it. If you're not a gardener, take advantage of the people that are, that are gardening. I was wondering what was happening out here in the foyer this morning. And I see all these plastic bags. I'm going, well, what, what does this church do? And then I heard the announcement by your pastor that said, you're welcome. And so it must be an ongoing occurrence. And some guy was talking about a zucchini as big as his arm. And I'm going, well, that's early on this season. But uh, zucchini is the kind of thing you try to get rid of, you know. And ladies put it in bread. And they put it, I mean, they try to hide zucchini. I mean, you just, you got so many. Once the thing starts growing, it's like, watch out, you know. Anyway, all that said, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, depending on who cooked the meal. It was a blessing and um, a blessing of good fellowship, too. How about this? If you want to find out what you're supposed to eat, don't talk to your doctor, including me. Talk to the Lord, right? We're seeing that the ideal diet for man is what was given to him by the creator of the man. So if you ever want to think about what are we going to eat in heaven, I will give you a few guarantees. It won't be fried chicken. And I hope that doesn't disappoint you because whatever God asks us in one area, he blesses us a hundredfold in a different area. So there must be something superior to the way God's doing things. So I hope that gives you a little uh, food for thought here. American Medical Journal 
every now and again you find some gems, and they're mostly ignored, but every you find them along the way. And of course, I'm looking through biased eyes. You know how biased I am because I think I'm right. See. <clears throat> Some of the common cancers may be related to inadequate oxygenation of vital tissues due to atherosclerosis. So in, to make it plain, if we starve the tissue of good quality oxygen, we set it up for a different metabolic process. Let's keep reading. It's intriguing that cancers of the breast, prostate, and colon are mainly found in societies afflicted with cardiovascular disease. So if we affect our blood vessels, and we basically occlude them, block them up, and we starve the body of oxygen, we get a variety of diseases that we don't want. One of them is what we're going to spend our next hour on talking about, and that is cancer. Some of the oldest treatments for cancer is, you might not like it, it's starvation. Because when you fast, you change the body's way of using many different metabolic processes. It automatically goes very conservative. That's why when you read some of these stories about how did the person make it for four months on whatever, rice, water down rice water, and you go, how, how, how'd that happen? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you remember when they were coming back from Vietnam, maybe you do remember this, and we'd see the POWs, and you didn't see one that was overweight. <laughs> Uh, you saw these people that you were hoping they were glad they made it and didn't damage the heart muscle, et cetera, et cetera. But they were literally, as we would say, skin and bones. What we found out from the Korean War is the guys that were captured during that war and then released after the war, when they did any type of angiograms or studies or some of the men didn't make it and they did the autopsy, their coronary arteries were completely clean. The same men that fell in that war, when we did their coronary arteries, guess what we found? We found significant plaque buildup in 22, 23, 24-year-old men. Now, both the guy in the foxhole and both the guy that was captured, don't tell me they didn't have a lot of stress. So what cleaned out the arteries of those men that were POWs? No, I don't want to starve. I like to eat food. I really enjoyed my lunch. So the goal isn't starvation. The goal is what can we learn from the principle? And the principle is most of us eat twice as much as what we need. We could eat half of what we eat, and we should be okay. Now, some of you, that would be the exception to the rule, and I use two rules. Number one, I want you to always have your energy. If you haven't got energy, then you, what's life about? And I want you to be able to get to and maintain a healthy weight. If you're doing those two qualifications, then you're probably eating somewhere near the right amount of fuel. On the other hand, I've also learned something else. <clears throat> I can't eat like I used to. You know, when you're in college, you take a group of people, and you go to one of those restaurants, all you can eat for $2.99 back then, you know? And they're glad to see you go. <laughs> because you take five guys from the dorm that always have something terrible to say about cafeteria food, you know? And you go out to a place like that, I, I think they lost money on us. Well, they don't lose money on me anymore. Because you can't eat like you did when you were 22 and don't expect yourself to. Metabolism changes. You may have more money in the bank account and afford to be able to eat more, but you shouldn't be eating more now. How's that? When you're broke, you kind of are thinner, aren't we? Back to our slide. This issue of getting oxygen to tissue is everything from we spoke about last night of one of the major causes of Alzheimer's and dementia right on through to when you deprive a tissue of oxygen, you increase the risk of getting cancer. Cancer cells live, we call it anaerobically. In other words, this whole exercise craze about aerobics is because aerobics means oxygen needing or oxygen requiring. Anaerobic metabolism has to do with very little oxygen. So a cancer cell is extremely inefficient with your food. 
For example, a breast cancer cell uses 17 times more fuel than a normal breast cancer cell. Maybe you've never jogged your mind at this, but how can something as big as my fist take my whole patient? Did that ever make sense to you? You know, I've got a 140-pound lady here, and I've got something that may weigh a pound, maybe a pound and a half, and that's what got her. I'm going, this is not making sense. But when you realize that that one pound uses 17 times the amount of fuel to run, and it puts off 17 times the amount of byproducts, we call those toxins, it starts to make a little more sense. But if I starve my body of oxygen, I'm going to increase the cancer and knock out the normal cells. Cancer is on the rise. Here's a chart up to 2,000. And you can see where we were about 550,000 people. Uh, I pulled up the re recent data here, 2022, and the uh, approximate deaths for that year, which is now last year, was 609,000. Now, if you go to the charts, so you know that I'm being fair, the charts will show you that lung cancer is on the decline. So why are the numbers still going up? It's because now I've got three 300 and, like I said, 30, 340 million people in the United States. These numbers are total numbers. What they're telling you as far as cancer going down is cancer per what we call the rate, cancer per 100,000 people. So on one hand, we see the total number going up, the need going up, the clinics going up, the imaging and radiation centers going up, we see whole cancer hospitals now, and we have all these specialties that we didn't have. If you want to know what's going wrong with us, look at the specialties. I mean, why do we need pediatricians? Aren't babies supposed to come out healthy and at least run on their own for at least till they're 20? Why do you need a doctor for a baby? Well, you should go, well, of course, that's simple. The babies need doctoring. Well, no, it's not that simple. Why does a child that's supposed to come out healthy and at least have a living chance have such problems? So I'm saying look at your specialties. When I was in school, to hear of an oncologist was kind of unusual and relatively rare. It's not that cancer was rare. It's that the excessive amounts of treatments were rare, the radiation, Surgery. Surgery was a big one back then, which oncologists, unless they're trained in surgery, didn't do. And so we had the surgeons that were doing a lot of the uh, surgical procedures back then. To put it in proper perspective, the same year, we're talking 2022, last year, there were more than 5 million skin cancers diagnosed. So when we talk about cancer this afternoon, skin cancer is not part of the equation. The good news is, out of those 5 million people that get skin cancer, the death rate is extremely small. And we're talking non-melanomas, uh, the bad one this time. And they also make another point that over 1.9 million new cancer cases were diagnosed that year outside of the skin cancer rate. This is data, again, from the Adventist Health Study, and this particular study has been going on since the 1950s, carried on, and some of you in this room may be in the Health Study 2, which is a study that was done off-site, so to speak. They handed you a questionnaire, and they thought you were getting a book, and it took you, I don't know how long to fill out. Are any of you in this room on Adventist Health Study 2? Some of you have taken that, and so we're still collecting data. We've moved out of California and opened it up. I think it's going to be exclusive to North America. So some of you are part of that study. And what we're tracking is we're trying to get, make the lifestyle correlation. What do you do? What's your exercise? All these questions. And what's the correlation with disease? This is from Advanced Health Study 1, OK? This is actual California data. So we got US mortality rates for 1991, so we're comparing the advanced population that were studied to their counterparts living in California, 1991. So here we are 30 plus years ago. 
I showed you this slide this morning when I was telling you about heart attacks and vascular problems. We showed that the meat-eating group of Adventists had a much lower rate than the average mortality because the average mortality would be considered a 100%. They only had 56%, the lacto ovo 39, and the 14. I want you to look at the cancer side because we're doing a little better. The meat-eating Adventists only have 42% of the cancer deaths as the general population. So what have we done? Well, in general, there's no smoking. In general, there's no alcohol. In general, even if an Adventist eats meat, they do a lot better at getting more fiber. They eat more of their vegetables. So at least we're trying to move in the right direction. If we look at that group, and when you go out there and if you go to a seminar or something, your, your buttons almost start popping because they start sharing you the Adventist health data and you go, boy, I'm glad to be in the right group. But I don't think we're doing good enough. I'm not happy with losing my friends. 42% of the normal rate, or you want to say that's a 58% reduction, lacto-ovo-vegetarian, about 32%. And then the vegan, plant-based, whatever your frame you want to use, is 3 to 4%, not 100%. That's over a 90% reduction. So that is something you should be proud of. But I want it to be you, and I want it to be me, because this is population data, and the individual can always prove me wrong. Or you can prove it right. Dietary fat and breast cancer we see the correlation. I'm going to run through these quickly because you, the slides almost look like I made the same slide and just copied it three times. As a general rule, they don't specify what type of fat. They specify total quantity. And as the quantity of fat goes up, we see that the death rate due to breast cancer continues to climb. And you already found the United States, haven't you? The only one that's higher than us is Canada, and we're very close. Then we have France, West Germany, Finland, Poland, Greece, Hong Kong, Mexico, Portugal, etc., etc. I wish I could tell you that Japan was still here, but I can't tell you that. As a general rule, as fat intake increases, we're going to see more of all cancers, not just this. But I want to point out something. When you look at Greece, uh, if you look at countries in that area. Uh, I don't have Italy on this, but when you look at Greece, what type of fat are they known for? Olive. 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 If you look at the United States, what kind of fat are we known for? At this time frame, in these dates, we're looking more at the beef and pork area and less of olive oil area. So, this slide doesn't give me the whole picture that I want, but I can look at various countries and go, okay, they're going to eat more of a certain type of fat than another country would. Let's take a look at the dietary fat from a different slide, because I want to find Italy, okay? Do you see Italy here on this slide? Italy, for the same amount of fat that is being consumed by places like Poland, or Romania, or Yugoslavia, or Puerto Rico, or Greece, or whatever. Italy, there's no doubt what they're known for. So why am I telling you this? Because we have a misconception that I can use all the olive oil I want and have no problem, and that's a wrong misconception. It's total fat intake, and it happens to be refined. So once again, we have Thailand, Japan down, Japan down here, and we have Canada, UK, United States, and this area. So this is just a more expanded slide than the one before it, that's all. Another purpose that we want to reduce dietary fat in general, and if you're going to eat fats, eat them the way God made them, we look at this. If you look at levels of estrogen on a typical American diet, you're going to have higher estrogen levels than on a plant-based diet, or they call it a starch-based diet here. And since we know that hormones play a role in stimulating tissue growth, then this would play a role, obviously, in the cancer of the breast. 
And so most of the time we find out a few things. First of all, relative biological levels of estrogen. We're seeing younger age of going through puberty and we're seeing a later age of going through menopause with a higher total estrogen level for those years and we see greater susceptibility. We take another group and we see them going through puberty later, they begin later and they quit sooner. So they have less exposure as far as time and less exposure as far as level of estrogen. We feel that plays a role in cancer. To show you the slide differently, we have the age of puberty, menses here. I want to show you something because it should startle you. In 1875, the average age for Japan, for Japanese young ladies was 16.5 years. Absolutely amazing. Why do I tell you this? Because I happen to believe that's probably getting closer to a person who hopefully is emotionally and a little ment more mental equipped to handle this. Can you imagine 12 years of age? They're trying to figure out, you know, should I play with my Barbie doll or, you know, go outside and jump rope? And here they are having to deal with heavy duty female, well, I don't need to tell you ladies. By 1950, 75 years later, they had dropped 1.3 years. 75 years it's starting to get less. What happened before 1950? World War II. America has this incredible concept that we're supposed to go rebuild countries before or after we have a war with them. Well, I'm glad that we do that. But maybe the other side of the coin might be better. And that is, why don't we do what we can to avoid the devastating effect of war before that. So what happened here? America comes in and the Japanese start consuming more American-like dietary regime. And what took 75 years took 10 years to lose the next 1.3 years. We're going in the wrong direction in a big hurry. And by 1970, we dropped another 1.4 years. And where this study was done, Two point, excuse me, it dropped another uh, point 0.3. So 12.2 years was the average age. Now, when we say average, we mean there's as many people before as many people after. That's what average. So this is right in, in the, uh, if you put everybody together and divide it by the total sum, that's what you come up with. For Americans, we compared them to Caucasians living here, 12.5 years. So Japan in that period of 100 years almost, basically did what? Become like you and become like me. American, in general, has been very generous with the world. We give them our diseases. I don't know where my roommate in Academy got this poster, but it was hanging on our dorm wall and what it was, was a poster of this man, African or Indian, I don't remember that, but I just remember that this guy was skinny. I mean, you could count ribs, he was sitting there. And right on the box, it had C-A-R-E. It was a care package given out by Red Cross or someone else. And the, and the box, this wooden crate was open, and guess what was in it? Babe Ruth bars. And you go, well, I like Babe Ruth. They were pretty good candy bars. No, that's not my point. Is that I've got this poor starving person that needs some good rice and beans, and I'm sending him candy bars. In our generosity as a country, we haven't always done the right thing. We send lactose deficient populations powdered milk. Well, that's like, folks, do you really want to wipe them out quicker? I mean, give me a break. The other thing we learned is this hasn't stopped. This is from the, uh, well, obviously from a, a, a book on gynecology, but we start here in 1830s, and they started saying, okay, what's happening to this diminishing of puberty in young ladies until we get down to our average age right now is a little more than 10. I happen to believe it's dietary. 
I happen to believe that the worst thing we're doing is how we're feeding our young ladies. I like data outside of the Adventist health system data. This comes out of Seattle, Washington, I believe. And they were looking at what types of food have the greatest impact, effect on breast cancer. If we look at meat, the group that had eats meat once a week, we called them our baseline. The, the ladies that ate meat two to four times per week had two and a half times the amount of breast cancer that their colleagues had in the first group. And if they ate meat three, excuse me, daily, seven or more times, they have almost four times the rate. Now you go, wait a minute, just because they do that, you can't prove anything. Well, that's not the point here. Remember the study of epidemiology, we look at the facts and we try to make sense out of it. I happen to believe there's enough correlation here to look into it. Then they pushed it a little further. They said, eggs, how many times do you eat eggs? Well, the group that eats eggs once a week, they put them equal to one. Well, if you eat eggs two to four times a week, what happens? Well, almost twice the breast cancer in that group. And if you eat them daily, almost three times. So you go, what's going on with the eggs business? Well, let's take a look at butter and cheese. They set the group that eats it once a week at one. If you eat it two to four times a week, it's three and a half or three and a quarter times. And if you eat it daily, it's two times. So I just see the news coming out. The more butter and cheese you eat, you reduce the risk of breast cancer. And I'm going, folks, ask for the starting point. And that's the kind of headlights I see, and I smile, because it's how to lie with statistics. And by the way, they're technically not lying. They're just not telling you the whole story, so I guess that's still a lie, right? And don't ask me why this happened. I don't know why. But what I do know is I appreciate the honesty of the researchers, because if I was doing the research, I'd be real tempted to leave out this last graph, wouldn't you? Because I want to prove a point. Well, I don't need to prove any point, because the data speaks for itself. Why daily consumption lowered the risk in this particular group, I don't know. But the trends, no matter, look, with the exception of that, you go, wait a minute. I have to reevaluate what I'm eating. Obviously, we don't need to spend more time on overweight, but as a general rule, when, the more weight we carry, the more likely we are to have uh, increase the cancer rate. Um, this is an interesting slide, and it goes along with what I've already covered as far as oils in general. But I want to show you specifically. We have a vegetable fat, and we have an animal fat. It's percentage of rats. Now, granted, this is a rat study, so relax a little bit. And we're looking, we've changed now. We're looking at tumors of the intestinal tract. And so if we give a, the rats 10% corn oil in their diet, we had 36% of them that had tumors in the intestinal tract. If we give 40%, and the reason we went for 40%, that's about the amount of fat that we eat. About 40% of the calories we eat come from that source. And they had 64 tumors, I mean, I'm sorry, 64%, three, two thirds of the group had tumors. I look at lard, 10% lard, and 17%. Now, please don't leave here and say that lard is better than corn oil because that would be a faulty assumption, even though that's what the data is showing. But look at when we raised lard to 40%, it's about equal. And you go, wait a minute, that's bad enough. I gave up lard 50 years ago. When it comes to cancer, the saturated fat in lard actually doesn't make you any more vulnerable and possibly a little less than the unsaturated fat in corn oil. That doesn't mean you're going to go back to eating lard. What it does mean is I should be very careful on any fat that I'm eating and do the best I can. I'm not going to take time with the chemistry. We're changing now. We've looked at breast. We looked at colon. Now we're going to look at prostate. So we're talking to the men now. And by the way, the biggest cancers are still the same big three and I just checked my 2022 data and my 2010 data, it hasn't changed. The biggies for men are still lung, are still prostate, and are still colon. 
The biggies for ladies are still lung, still breast, and still colon. That hasn't changed for the past probably 20, 30 years. So we need to do better on what we're talking about. Fat consumption, as the fat consumption goes up, prostate cancers, deaths go up. The good news about prostate cancer is we're treating it a little bit less aggressive now. We went through an age in the late 80s, 1980s, uh, tw uh, into, into 2000, maybe in 2005, when we were treating prostate cancer very aggressively. And I felt we did more harm than good. Most urologists for men have backed off. They're not doing as much as far as invasive and possible testing that can cause a man to lose everything from quality of life to uh, his own life itself. But let's do some prevention. If we want to prevent breast, excuse me, prostate cancer, we're going to eat like the Philippines or we're going to eat like El Salvador or Japan. And we're up here at United States and Norway and Sweden. And, you get it. and once again, I want to point out Italy to you. And I want to point out, uh, I don't know if I have Greece on here, so we don't. But the, Italy, I do? I, OK, thank you. Uh, Italy, being known for that type of fat, if Italy was all the way down here and eating this much fat, then I would say that olive oil could be potentially protective. Obviously, it's not. More fat you consume, the greater risk. And this is for males here. Once again, we're back to colon. Once again, the same picture over and over. And by the way, these are actually different slides, just different data from different sources. Many of you have heard of the China study, Dr. Campbell. Dr. Campbell started out believing that the way to cure world hunger was we need to get protein to them. The reason they had so much cancer is because they weren't getting adequate protein. So he did research in the Philippines, and he says, okay, what do I have to work with? Well, they obviously have a lot of fish on the coast, but how do I preserve the fish and get it inland so these people can have a higher protein diet? Well, that wasn't working out too well because the refrigeration was a luxury, not standard procedure. So that wasn't working out. Well, what crop can I do or what animals can they raise? Well, let's go through some of the data that he came back home He's from here, obviously, the United States, because what he found out is the data that he kept compiling was the people that got the most protein, the people that were wealthy enough to afford it, had the greatest amount of liver cancer. And he starts going, maybe I need to change what I'm thinking. So let's take a look at some of his data. Laboratory rats, he's back home now, fed different amounts of protein. The laboratory rats that were fed 5% protein had the low rate of cancer growth. The rats that were fed 20% obviously had a high rate. Now, he wasn't feeding them carcinogens. He was feeding them rat chow with different percentages of protein in. Set up another study, two groups of laboratory rats now, and he wanted to push it. He said, OK, we're going to inject high-dose carcinogen into those rats, so something that causes cancer, and feed them a low-protein diet. So on a low-protein diet, even with a cancer-causing agent, he found out that they were low in the response to cancer. And then he turned it around. He gave an injection of a low-dose carcinogen and had on a high-fiber diet, excuse me, high-protein diet, and they developed a high rate to cancer. So his conclusion was even a rat that's exposed to cancer in their lifestyle, if they're on a low-protein diet, has a lot less response. And even a rat on a high-protein diet with minimal exposure to a carcinogen has a much greater cancer response. So he thought he was on to something, and he went on. Now, we're looking at a different researcher here. You may recognize the name of Walter Longo. He is a gerontologist studying old people, which I guess, as of today, I qualify. Huh? <clears throat> and he looked and said, OK, what's with this protein thing? First of all, are we overeating on protein? Dr. Campbell says yes. 
In fact, overeating of protein can actually cause the metabolism to go so rapid, and rapid growth in the body is one of the hazards of cancer. So on a high-protein diet, this came out interesting, in a high-protein diet was greater than 20% of your calories. Uh, in that chart way back this morning, I was showing you that Americans eat somewhere between 12 or 13% of their diet as protein, and we consider that excessive. So this 20% is definitely a high-protein diet. He said 74% increase in overall mortality. Uh, mortality is dying. So people on a high-protein diet between 50 to 65 obviously die more frequently. And they had a 28% reduction in overall mortality if you're over 65. I'm, I'm going, wait a minute. Okay, what's going on here? You're telling me that as I age, I need more protein. Okay, so how's that settle? I'm going, because first of all, I'm having a problem with your data. Or as we get old, we absorb less, and I've got to put more in my mouth to get it to my body. Or as my tissue breaking down, yeah, I know I'm getting more wrinkles and don't have the same amount of muscles I used to. So maybe, but then I went, you look a little deeper to explain this, and it says this. The group, the high-protein group, which means they had a 28% reduction in overall mortality, but they had a four-fold increase of cancer. And they had a five-fold increase in diabetes. And I'm going, <clears throat> um, I don't think I'm interested in a 28% improvement and a 400% change here and a 500% change there. So it kind of puts the data in proper perspective because you're not actually doing that much better enough to justify the diseases we get. And then, of course, he studied two other things, moderate, and he also studied low protein. He called less than 10%. And let's go to less the next sign because the next one is going to give us the information we had. When did it disappear? He put it down. The relationship disappeared. In other words, everything we just talked about, the disease rate, the increase in mortality, the decrease of reduction, the fourfold cancer, the fivefold diabetes, getting diabetes in these age groups, it says the relationship disappeared if eating plant protein. The folks that ate plant protein didn't get more diabetes, did not get more cancer, and didn't have an increased death rate in that group. So if you're going to mess up and you feel you have to be on higher protein, please do it on plant. But better yet, we don't need excessive protein. We need enough to make what the body needs. Colon cancer and meal frequency. We talked about Dr. Capp's work before lunch, showing that meal frequency or eating times was as critical for prevention of disease as what you eat. He was looking at timing. Let's look at this. Meals per day, two, three, or four, the risk of rectal cancer, two or less, they put their risk at one, and colon cancer, put it at one. If you eat three meals a day, that group had almost doubled this, 1.7, and one and a half here. If you eat four meals a day, you ha increase your risk of rectal cancer and colon cancer, almost doubling it. So what's the take home message? There must be something about eating a meal and giving the body a chance to process that food and recover than continuing to eat progressively. Obviously, it seems like a progression. The more times a day I eat, the more problem I'm gonna have with my intestinal tract. And like I said this morning, I've never had anyone starve by skipping supper. But I will tell you my own experience a little bit. When my wife decided, no, when we decided that we were going to go on two meals a day, guess what I did? In the back of your mind, you know, breakfast is fine. Eat really good. You come to lunch and you go, man, I don't get to eat again till tomorrow morning. So I had to get over the psychological battle that I'm telling you about, because what did I do at my lunch? I ate enough for lunch, and so I tried to make up for it, just in case I might get hungry. Well, I've been able to tell you 
that after 30 years, I don't have that psychological problem anymore. But initially, boy, I was, I'm going, man, this is, this is going to be rough. Well, guess what? It's almost, I mean, I don't know how many times you tighten up your day, but eating can be also a waste of time. It's usually a good waste of time. But by going from two meals instead of three meals, guess what you do? Most of the time, the cook will love you. Okay. The second thing is, if you're the dishwasher, you don't have to do it twice a day, not three times a day. And by the way, it does consume time. So if you're short on time and have more activities to get done, you actually can make yourself a little more efficient. So if you're the kind of person that's working too many hours, you know, guilty, uh, then you may see it actually as an advantage. I want to deal a little bit with skin cancer because we don't talk about it on the charts because we got 5 million people last year that got skin cancer, and that's ongoing, and we've blamed a lot on sun, and that is true that excessive sun exposure can call, do that. But I want to get down to possibly a reason behind why the sun can do that. And that is we have on a low-fat diet, I'm sorry, let's get up here. Low-fat diet decreases precancerous skin lesions. The number of lesions, the number of spots, dots, whatever you want to call it, on a low-fat diet, 21% or less of your calories from fat. That actually is fairly liberal on fat intake, but let's go with their data. We had three people was the number of lesions that they had, okay, on this dietary regime. We come down here to the average American diet, which is almost 40% fat, and they had 10. What I want you to compare is the two groups. This group had about one-third the amount of skin cancers, precancers, as the other group. So what have we learned? That the sun may not be the dominant problem with skin cancer. The sun may actually be a cofactor that causes it. But if you're on a low-fat diet, the skin cancer goes down by at least a third or two one-third of it. So if we're eating healthfully, we should be able to gain the benefits of good sun exposure without gaining the negatives of what's going on with our skin. So by the way, I'm still recommending that you go out in the sun. I'm not convinced that going to the beach and getting a super tan is the best way to handle your skin. I'm also not convinced that the skin blockers are really doing the job. The, I should say sun blockers. The sun blockers actually have some chemicals in that are demonstrated maybe part of the problem with the skin cancer. Now, shade is always the best way to handle the sun. Why do you think they wear sobreros, you know? I mean, when you can shade yourself, that's the best way to handle excessive sun. So I want to ask you what your favorite hat is when you're out there mowing the yard or working in the garden. But my point is, that's a better way to handle it than smearing cream all over you to try to deal with the sun. We wanted to find out how unique Adventists were, and we found out a few things. One thing we found out is we wanted to compare ourselves with another population that usually do not smoke and do not drink. And we wanted to compare it with another population that eats a lot more red meat than we do. So what you're really seeing a slide here is what is the effect of beef consumption on longevity between two populations. The two populations are obviously Mormons and Adventists. Mormon women, well, let's start with the general population, 100%, we set them at that level. So Mormon women have less cancer mortality, death rate, than the average population. So obviously they're doing something to reduce that. I happen to believe it's alcohol and smoking. I think those are the two major factors that they're doing that reduces their rate of cancer. So. We've got Mormon women at 83% and Mormon women at, excuse me, Mormon men at 68%. We compare that to our Adventist Health Study data. 
So we have Adventist women at 68%, and we have Adventist men at 52%, about half the amount of cancer in the general population. The biggest difference between these two groups is going to be meat consumption. Most Adventists don't drink alcohol. Less of even Adventists smoke. So we've got those two biggies out of the way, and that's the best correlation I can make. So every step a population makes usually improves their or decreases their, their death rate from cancer. A few things that we want to learn about fats and what they can do is this whole concept of omega-3 fats. Omega-3 fats are what your body needs. It's one of the essential fatty acids. It's critical. You have to have it. There's no one that can live on a fat-free diet. It, and by the way, it doesn't exist unless we make it. So flaxseed, a tablespoon of flaxseed or linseed oil has this many milligrams of omega-3 fats. And you go through the whole list here. You see, it, you see it going down, all the way down to a California avocado has 99 almonds, a quarter cup, spinach, green, be uh, green soybeans, excuse me, etc. Now, everything on this list I'm not recommending. Like, for example, I'm not recommending you go use Crisco, okay? I'm just showing you what it has in there. You will always be best getting your omega-3s from the whole food, whether it be flaxseed itself, whether it be walnuts, black or English walnuts, whether it be soybeans, whether it be spinach, almonds, that's the best. And when we're looking for a total of about 5,000 milligrams or 5 grams of omega-3 fats a day, you can see that if you just do your flaxseed, you're good. And by the way, I don't have chia on my list. Chia is slightly higher than the flax. And so some of you are already doing that. Some of you grind your own. Some of you put it in your pancakes, your waffles. Some people put it on their salad. That's fine. But I want you to remember that if you grind your own flaxseed, please do it on a somewhat regular basis. The flaxseed industry came out with some interesting data. And if you grind flaxseed, and don't do anything, just leave it out, room air, okay? That within seven days, it oxidizes to the point where you get, you're not getting the benefit. In fact, you can actually be getting some harm. So some people say, well, you have to grind it and use it right away. Well, that's kind of pushing the point. At least if you're going to grind it, use it in the next few days and not past a week. That brings me to the next point. Don't go to the health food store and buy your flaxseed already ground in a package. Because I don't know when they did it. Please don't do that. It might be more convenient, but it would be better for you. And if you're price conscious, you can buy a whole pound of flaxseed, grind your own, and believe me, you'll be way ahead of any health food store. Well, let's finish the rest of the slide. We've got turnips. We've got bananas, we've got apples, we've got potatoes, we've got cucumbers, we've got whole bread. So don't feel like you have to get it all from flaxseed. Some of you may not like flaxseed. Well, God didn't say you have to eat flaxseed. But he does give us a variety of good fats and a variety of the food that he's created. If someone gives you a pound of flaxseed for a birthday present, Barbara, watch out what I'm saying. It may be they have some motive behind it. So let's take a look at this. Disorders that may benefit from flaxseed. <clears throat> now, when you go through these disorders, they get kind of interesting. Rheumatoid arthritis, I'm sorry, but r the right type of fats seem to be able to help the immune system to deal with that, so to speak, bad program where your body's attacking itself. Raynaud's disease, some of you are familiar with that, that is a circulation disease, usually affecting people's hands, and your hands can blanch. I mean, it's like the, the, the circulation just gets shut down, especially with cold exposure. Uh, psoriasis, gastrointestinal ulcers, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease all have been shown to have benefit. When I gave my initial thing, I was talking about the other side. Depression can help. Overaggressiveness. So I'm saying if you get a pound of flaxseed for a present, someone might think that you are <clears throat> overaggressive or if you're depressed. 
Uh, and then the two last things are prevention of breast cancer, the possible prevention of breast cancer and colon carcinoma. And this one gets my interest because my training in lung diseases is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. It's just you do what you can to try to function with it. You do what you can to try to slow the progression down. But the concept of changing it or turning it around was just not there when I was getting my training. Here we're seeing that we can actually help to prevent it or actually improve the ability of the body to transfer oxygen. Critical. OK. Um, how's my time going? Uh, this will bring enough humor that I think it will be appreciated, OK? Once again, we have how much fat we're consuming, 50 grams, 59 in these various foods. Once again, I want you to read the first thing here. One uh, small bucket of Cineplex, uh, Odin, popcorn, et cetera, et cetera, is equivalent to six of the Kentucky Fried Drumsticks. This is fat content now, which is equivalent to 42 pounds of jelly bean. And by the way, this is not nutritional advice, folks. It's trying to make a point. I don't want you eating 42 pounds of jelly beans. I don't, if you do, I don't want to see you for at least a month, OK? Or it's equivalent to 500 carats. So you can spend, you can watch a movie, and in one night, blow out 500 carats. That's the point of the slide, OK? So I'm trying to show you how much I can feed you for the same amount of fat. So let's look at another one. Let's come down here to eggplant parmesan. Four Snickers bars, five and a half egg rolls, or 310 cups of spinach. Are you starting to get maybe the way God wants us to use fats, like very sparingly? And I'll put a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, let's go with 86 grams. Uh, Tim, whatever. You know, I don't eat this stuff, folks. And if you can pronounce it, I'm worried about you. Uh, nine and a half glazed Dunkin' Donuts, 86 pieces of white Wonder Bread, or 172 apples, all for the same fat. And they'll eat this at one meal, and by the time you finish all 172 apples at your next meal, I don't have to worry about you. <laughs> How about the last one? Fettuccine Alfredo, five Hostess cherry fruit pies, 31 pieces of bacon, 400. He's got a whole year's worth of potatoes for you and your spouse there for the same amount of fat that someone will eat at one fancy restaurant. Folks, can you afford it? Incredible. Do you wonder why that we Americans are carrying around more weight than what we should? I mean, it's, it, you can't eat this way. You can't eat this way and expect to be healthy. It does not exist. You come over here to God's Whole Foods and you get blown away. You go, how's that for real? Well, it's for real because potatoes are very low in fat. Until you put what? Until you start fattening them up. Um, I'm going to skip a few because I want to hit the foods that are actually preventive. And the reason they're preventive is because of the nutrition they have in it. Let's take a look at vitamin A first. Anything that is yellow, red, dark green. You know, I was looking at my plate when I was going through line. Maybe this time we got, I had carrots. That was beautiful. Someone made some awesome greens. I had some green beans. What I have? Oh, the salad was nice. If your plate looks colorful, you got a good chance of getting some good nutrients in there. Uh, <clears throat> so I got orange jams, one cup. It's going to give me my RDA of over four times, 436% of my vitamin A. You keep, well, it's carrots, pumpkin, sweet potatoes, red bell peppers, or sweet red bell peppers, cantaloupe, uh, mixed or frozen vegetables, spinach, all the way down to collards, and even lettuce. Granted, it doesn't have a lot of nourishment. But lettuce also doesn't have many calories. So enjoy it if you like that in your salad. Eating meat, poultry, and fish increases ovarian cancer. So the lacto-vegetarian, that's the basis. In this group, mortality per 100,000 people, 15.9. Meat once or twice, once one to three times per week, 18. 
And if you're eating it over four times a week, it jumps to 26. So not quite doubling between those groups. And I don't have the plant-based person over here because the study didn't do that. Now, let's deal with what we call the elements of a cancer-protective lifestyle. We've gone through vitamin A. Proper diet is what we started with on that first slide. Fruits, vegetables, cereal grains, and nuts are basically the best way to nourish your body. Pro maintain proper weight. Eating this way definitely helps. Regular meals and no snacks. Why are we saying no snacks? Your digestive system is made to process food. For example, the good lunch we had. I expect most of you to process that food between two and three hours. And then you want to give your stomach at least an hour or two of rest before you have your popcorn and apples, which is what, what are you laughing about? That's what Adventists do every, it, it, I mean, it's like tradition, right? I mean, you know. Anyway, I'm being a little bit facetious, and that's fine, but the point is, that I want your stomach empty before you put something else in, number one. The next rule, I want your stomach empty before your head hits the pillow. So if you're eating at 8 o'clock at night and you're trying to get in bed by 10, you're not going to have the same quality sleep as you would if you don't work your stomach all night. And then you get up in the morning and your stomach says, if you feed me, I'm going to puke on you. And, you, and people say, they say it nicely, I can't eat in the morning. Well, what they're really saying is they work their intestinal tract all night long, and the, and the body basically has given that signal. It's called no hunger. I, oh, I don't feel hungry in the morning. Well, when did you eat supper? Oh, we eat at 8 o'clock at night. I didn't say it didn't taste good. I'm saying that if you follow the physiology and want to do what the body wants you to do, you'll find a different story. Aerobic exercise, everything from walking to swimming to riding your bike, sunlight and moderation, and stress control. That's probably a whole other lecture, but that is critical for immune functioning. Benefits, I've already showed you this slide, so we're going to skip it because vegetarian diet has all the components to stay away from disease and to help you out. Cancer protective vegetables in the fruits category, and you know these, everything from blueberries that have been written about, even in women's magazines, to uh, daily knowledge, almost strawberries, plums, oranges, grapes, citrus. On the vegetable side, we've got kale, lettuce, Brussels sprouts, etc., etc., garlic, leeks. Let's move it up. And we go on with our citrus, our apricots, our oranges, our grapefruit, our kiwi, raspberries, etc., etc. On the vegetable side, we've got our garlic, we've got our turnips, our tomatoes, our mixed vegetables, our yams, our pumpkin, uh, watermelon, cantaloupe, bell peppers. Sounds like a pretty good meal. If we deal with weight, increases risk of cancer, we find that those at 20 to 30 percent above average weight. Um, and by the way, it is still true that men have more cancer than you women. But look at this slide just for a minute. Men are purple, or whatever is here, and women are yellow. Look at what weight does to women compared to what it does to men. Now, men, this doesn't give you permission to be overweight. That's not the take-home message of this slide. But ladies, please take home the take-home message, and that is that weight seems to be a greater factor, and you're more predisposed to the effect of being overweight. That's what this slide should tell you. Uh, this is just giving the actual chemical names, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, your sulforaphines, your diathenes, your broccoli, your resveratrol, your... Anyway, we're going through the chemistry that's actually in the food. And so whether you're dealing with caffeinic acid, by the way, that's not caffeine, uh, elging acid, proteinase inhibitors, et cetera, et cetera, all the chemistry is there because God put it there. And you don't have to know the chemistry to eat blueberries because they're not going to taste any different whether you know what's in them and whether it's not as long as they're ripe. Top 10 top antioxidant, maybe I'm killing this, good, but we'll go through it quickly. 
On the fruit side, you have the same ones we've mentioned. On the vegetable side, the 10 top antioxidant vegetables, number one is garlic. You may lose a few friends on that one, so the best thing you do, if you invite someone over, you give them a piece of garlic bread, or you, or you make sure that they eat the garlic first, and then you won't have to worry about losing a friend. If you eat the garlic first before they get there, they may politely excuse themselves. Let's move it up. We've got the kiwi, grapefruit, white grapes, bananas, apples, tomatoes. On the vegetable side, we've got everything from corn to alfalfa sprouts to broccoli to beets. Sources of vitamin E. So we've talked about A. Now we're going to work on E for a minute. So everything from wheat germ to sunflower seeds to almond butter to various oils. Like I said, this is a complete chart. It's not we recommend each thing on here. And we move it up, and we're going to deal with everything from our blueberries to our soybeans to our spinach to our wheat germ. All have certain quantities of your vitamin E. Your vitamin C, I don't know. I'm boring you. It's getting repetitive. The same foods that God made have your vitamin E, your vitamin A, your vitamin C already in. Hey, we even got cabbage on this one. We're back to the same place where we started. If you think I'm going in circles, uh, I kind of am because it always comes down to the same conclusion. The same conclusion is that you tell me a disease and I'll tell you how to take care of it, because guess what? Same story, second verse. If you don't like that, we sing the third verse. If you don't like that one, I've had four verses to sing, one last night and three today. If you think that I don't know anything else, well, I'm telling you what I know best. And when it comes to health, eating a diet that is plant-based, as unrefined as possible, and an adequate quantity to give you your strength, to give you a proper weight, to give you your mental faculties, is what God's been trying to offer us. And man has come along and messed it all up. See, I wouldn't have a career if man didn't mess up food. I'm serious. What career would I have if man didn't mess it? I'd be here trying to get healthy, and you go, what's he talking about? Farming. Why do we need to listen to him? Well, the only reason you're listening to me is because I'm trying to encourage you to either keep doing the right thing, or you've let yourself slide, and you go, you know what? Yeah. I mean, every time you go to the grocery store, you get conditioned because they think that what they have on the shelves you're supposed to buy. And you go in there, and you walk through the aisles, and they have so much stuff they don't write poison on the box. Well, maybe on the rat food section or something. Okay. So if you go to a store, you have to shop around the outside, like we say, you know, where all the vegetables and fruit are and stay out of the middle kind of deal uh, from that standpoint. Or if you want to shop in your own garden, some of you have that privilege. I think that's awesome. Or some people, you find that you shop from co-ops and you buy yourself in bulk. And as far as being healthy, it does take time. It does take time. It takes more time to prepare a healthy meal than to put something in the microwave. On the other hand, if you actually monitored the cost, you would find that it's less expensive and takes less time than the total time put in that. How much time do you think it takes to buy a frozen pizza at the store? You go, well, I've got the money, so it takes me about 10 seconds. And then I take it home, put it in the microwave, that takes four minutes, and then I can sit down and eat. But I'm saying if you consider the total time of growing the wheat, the production, everything like that, you'd find it's a matter of who spends the time. And I'm encouraging you because I don't know where you can get good food, except that you make it. And now we've got some restaurants and some places that are doing better. I will admit that. Um, and I don't know. I look around here. Some of you men may be as blessed as I am because I have a great cook. 
and I realize that, and I am willing to work harder to support a good cook. Maybe you men ought to take the tip if you haven't already caught on. That if you support the good cook, then so on. And so my cook tells me, she goes, you know how you like those good tools in your shop? You know, like, like Makita and stuff, you know? And she goes, well, that's the kind of blender I want. And that's the kind of food product. She goes, don't get me junk. Get me, so yes, um, you, you, it's, it's worth you spending your money on a good tool to make life easier. I'll tell you about one tool, and then I'll let you talk. How's that? We bought a food processor, but it wasn't a food processor that you normally would get at Walmart, okay? This is called Robocoop. And Robocoop, if you know the whole dietary or the whole food service industry, it's a name for professional equipment in a rest. This is a kind of, we talk about bushels of throughput in this machine. For example, if I wanted to chop up vegetables, how many bushels per hour can this thing chop? It's that kind of machine. So we bought strawberries, and we bought about 10 gallons of strawberries. And before you freeze them, you can obviously freeze them whole. This particular time, we were going to slice them up and freeze them in preparation. I can slice about 10 gallons of strawberries in about 10 minutes with this machine. So not 10 hours, 10 minutes. And it's the kind of throughput where you put them in one area and they fly out the other. You don't even have to clean the machine out. So when I tell you that it's worth supporting your good cook if you have one, uh, you can either drop the hint if you're the lady on your next birthday to your husband, or you can cook such good food that he doesn't even want to go out to eat. How's that? So I hope that was a little great tip, an advertisement for my wife as well as uh, that you men will catch on. Okay, it's well worth it. So, uh, we have a microphone. Oh, my wife's going to speak. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say that we've had it for, what, 30 years? Oh, yeah, we don't buy junk, yeah. We're going strong, and we've got it used. Yeah. So you go to the used, you know, food service places, and it's a roof, and it'll last forever. Thank you, sweetheart. Yeah, raise your hand, and I'll stick a microphone in your face. Doctor, I mentioned to you before about GMOs, but I thought the people here would want to hear what you told me. Sure, be glad to. The, the question was about genetically modified, and by the way, I don't even like them calling it organism because I don't consider my corn an organism. I consider it a vegetable, but that's the name they give it. Now, GMOs actually were done not just maliciously for the most part, but yet it can turn out that way. And when you develop a food, if I was the producer, I'd look at it in a few different ways. Number one, shelf life. How can I deal with shelf life? You heard a man here spoke last evening. He said, if I wash my v fruits in a vinegar water solution, my strawberries last longer. Well, the answer is, yes, if you get rid of bacteria, you're going to have less fermentation. They're going to last longer. Well, what, what if you were growing corn... What would you want to do? You want to get the most production with the least amount of weed killers with the greatest amount of basically time when that corn would still be good before it would rot or ferment or the germ would go bad. So along comes GMOs. So that's the good side. You see, when I do fly, I get to talk to people, and I don't tell, tell them that I'm you know, who I am because I want to find out what they know. And one time I had the opportunity to sit with a man who was responsible for GMO. Did the laboratory report? He says, we have to hide what we're doing because we are constantly investigated to find out. So Monsanto was the person or the company that this man was investigating. So I had my ear really good. He said, we are still unlocking the genetic code that Monsanto is using in their things. I'm saying, well, why? Because he saw it as positive. He says, we use less insecticides, less pesticides, and less fungicides. And I'm going, well, you're keeping opening my eyes because I consider that positive. He said, we don't have to kill the weeds as much or 
you know, we're working through that. They're resistant to this, resistant to that. And so I didn't tell him what I knew about what the GMOs were doing to humans. So the research that we have out now is that GMO foods, I'm, I'm going very general here because you'd have to go with each specific species and what they've done. A genetically modified grain, let's take corn for example, means that man can't make genetic material. The most that man can do is to go in and manipulate the genetic code by replacing it with something else, cutting it out, removing it, doing something. That's all man can do. When I hear people say that COVID was man-made, I'm going, man is not God. Man can't make COVID. The most they can do is take one virus and adjust it or make it more virulent or make it more contagious or something. We, we're, we're not God, okay, number one. Number two, we have found that GMOs, can change the genetic material in the bacteria in your intestinal tract. Now, at first you go, well, that's just more bacteria. I just get rid of that and we go on our merry way. I'm saying, no, no, listen, listen closely. If it can change the genetic material of the bacteria in your intestinal tract, you should listen up. The research that I haven't had yet, and I haven't looked at this research for a while on this particular topic, is can it actually change the DNA of you and me as ourselves? The other thing that you may not understand is that the amount of cells of bacteria that you have in the intestinal tract is greater than the number of cells you have in your body. Most people don't realize that. It's, they're much smaller, so you can get a lot more in less area. So let's go back to last night when we were talking about your immune system and your immune system is the greatest quantity or the largest amount of immune tissue is your intestinal tract. And I told you last night, if I was playing devil's advocate and I wanted to destroy a nation or a people or the world, I would do things to mess up your immune system. I would give you a lot of antibiotics, preferably even when they're not needed in my opinion, I would give you foods that would inflame the bowel, and I would do everything I can to reduce the bacterial function as a normal function of your immune system, and then along comes GMO foods, and I have to add that to the list. Why do you think we're having so many issues? Why do you think we have so many people? Last night the question was about probiotics. Well, the reason we need probiotics is because we mess something up, not because we, we should never need probiotics, but because we take steroids or we take antibiotics, we change the whole bacterial climate. So the short of GMO, what I know, is that it has been demonstrated to change the genetic material and the bacteria in the bowel. So it can change a cell. It can change a bacteria. As far as it actually getting to you and I with my kidney or my liver or whatever tissue, haven't seen that yet. So most of you are probably similar to me. You're going to do as much non-GMO as possible. I also know that eating GMOs or eating non-GMOs is not going to get me off this planet. So I don't like to make it like a religion. But if you have a choice and the ability to get better food, please do it. Now here's the good news. 85% of corn is GMO. The good news is 15% isn't. Same with soybeans. Now what is the human consumption of soybeans compared to the total 15%? So it is possible when they say non-GMO that they're not lying to you and that you can still get your quote whole foods non-GMO. GMO is different than hybrid. Hybrid corn, because they make it sweeter and that something, is not a GMO. That's like taking mom and dad and they make an offspring, okay? And you don't say, hey kid, <clears throat> you're a hybrid. Well, you, may, you, know, you know, whatever you want to call him. But you don't call him a GMO, okay? So same thing with a lot of our crops. So don't put hybrid foods in the same category as GMO. GMO means that man has actually manipulated the genetic work, not just cross-pollination, etc. So that's a long answer, wasn't it? We have a microphone if you'd like to 
ask a question, make a comment. Wow, either I did a good job or you folks have got <coughs> lunch sedation. <coughs> That's a new word, huh? Lunch sedation? <laughs> anyway, uh, from my perspective, thank you once again. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the opportunity to share. And I hope if I've encouraged you a little more on your walk, not only in the area of health, but uh, allowing the Lord to direct and lead. We're living in a time when we can't afford to be slack as far as what, what, we're, what we're going through here. We need to be able to make the right decisions at the right time, and I'm convinced that the Lord will allow us to do that if we'll be faithful. Well, thank you, Dr. Collins, very, very much. Thank you for staying by. And uh, we'll have our closing prayer, and we'll uh, let you get on with your afternoon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this Sabbath day, the wonderful blessing that is ours. And Father, we appreciate so much the information that we have gathered over the last uh, day, and we're appreciative of the wonderful news and guidance that you give us through Scripture, through the spirit of prophecy. Father, we thank you for all this wonderful advice at our fingertips. We do pray that we honor you by, by taking care of our bodies. Bless us now the rest of this Sabbath day. Be with Dr. Collins and Diane as they travel, home, travel south, I should say. Bless them as they go on their journey in Jesus' name. Amen.